Welcome to the Innova Buzz podcast, where our job is to help you build visibility, professional credibility, and connection with your ideal client by putting the human at the center of innovative marketing so you can build and strengthen an engaging, enduring relationship with your ideal clients. I'm Jürgen Strauss from Innovapiz, and I'm honored that you're here with me. If you haven't joined our wonderful marketing transformation community yet, go to innovabiz.co and collect your free gift as well. Do subscribe to the show and also leave a review because it helps others find us. Let's get into today's masterclass on this InnovaBuzz podcast. To me, glad to be here is an ethos. It's a mindset. It's a way you choose to see the world and, and the way you live. It's, it's the ability to see a glass as half full and not half empty. Okay. So it, when you live through, when you, when you have a mindset of gratitude and gratefulness, it actually activates the area in our brains where our perceptions come from. And so it allows you to see a situation, take coronavirus, you can see that as an opportunity or a threat. They're both right. I can give you examples for both, right? So that the idea is, how do you see the world? But here's what gets really cool, is as you adapt this ethos of glad to be here, it changes the way the world sees you. And that, as a business leader, is breakthrough. That's critical. Welcome back. I hope you've had an awesome week so far. If you haven't yet listened to my recent conversations with Noah Laphart of Variable and the Code Story podcast, and also with referral coach and author of Radical Relevance, Bill Cates, then do check them out, but only after you've listened to today's conversation. I'm really excited to have on the Innova Buzz podcast as my guest today, John Foley. He's a former lead solo pilot of the Blue Angels, a Sloan Fellow at Stanford School of Business, a top-rated leadership keynote speaker, also a self-defined gratitude guru, and expert in the how of high-performance teams. His fearless success system has transformed thousands of organizations around the globe, and he's the author of the book Fearless Success Beyond High Performance. In our discussion today, John talked to me about the five things to do to create a culture of personal responsibility in your team, how to get into your high-performance zone with a clarity of vision and a purpose higher than self, and he explained the best debrief ever. Without further ado then, let's fly into the hive and get the buzz from John Foley. Hi, I'm your host, Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz, and I'm really excited to welcome to the InnovaBuzz podcast today from Sun Valley in Idaho in the USA, John Foley. John's a retired Navy pilot of the Blue Angels. He's also a Sloan Fellow at the Stanford Graduate School of Business and author of Fearless Success Beyond High Performance. And that's all about his time in the service, but how that applies to your business and to your life and why our mindset is absolutely crucial to our life. So welcome to the Innova Buzz podcast, John. It's a real privilege to have you here as my guest. Well, thank you, Jürgen. Uh, I'm glad to be here. And that's a, a saying that by the end of our podcast will become much more meaningful to everybody. Yes, yes. And you're, and you're wearing a T-shirt there that says glad to be here right across the front. Um, people can't see that, obviously, on the podcast, but I can. Yes. Now, Ken Foster, who was our guest on episode 260 of the Innova Buzz podcast, suggested that we have a conversation with you, John. So a big hello to Ken as well. Yes, thank you, Ken. I'm sure everyone enjoyed him. Amazing, amazing career. Yes, yes. It was a wonderful conversation. Now, I'm really excited today to talk about the culture and mindset of excellence in particular um, and how your past experience 
applies to business and life and the whole glad to be here philosophy. Before we get on to some of that, give us a bit of a whistle stop tour of your background because I know that's really fascinating. Well, uh, I'm going to start at 12 years old when my dad took me to an air show. I'll never forget this day. I look up in the sky. <laughs> I happen to see these six magnificent blue jets flying that day. I turned to my dad. And I said, Dad, I'm going to do that. A uh, 12 year old <laughs> kid, you know, had no idea how to get there. And I think that's really uh, a nice metaphor for business and life, too. And that is uh, the dream comes first, right? The vision comes first. And the more we can really uh, embody that vision, uh, then we can figure out the how. So for me personally, um, I felt it, man. I felt it in my heart. I could smell the, the smoke oil in the air. And it was just something that, that, that I was going to do. And then with all of the entrepreneurs out there, all the business leaders, um, you know, things don't happen the way we expect them usually, right? And there's a lot of challenges and obstacles and that happened to me. I got rejected three times when I tried to join the military. They said I was not physically qualified. Surprised me, but got around that. Um, ended up going to Naval Academy. Uh, did it eventually uh, graduate and uh, started flying jets off aircraft carriers. And uh, we can talk more about what that's like. Uh, but it was a pecking order and uh, flew A7s off the carrier Enterprise. Flew in the movie Top Gun. I don't know. Did you ever see that mm. movie? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yes, I did. Yeah. So I was one of the, the, the real pilots flying in that, um, just in the right place at the right time, right? Uh, but then became an instructor pilot, flying F-18s, teaching Marines, uh, became a Blue Angel, which is a very unique experience that I'm happy to go into. Uh, but after that, I think my life really changed. I reinvented myself, you know, instead of saying, well, I'm going to do a long career in the military, I, my dad showed me you could have multiple careers. And I used school as my bridge getting, you know, from the military, uh, ended up going to Stanford Business School, got three master's degrees, worked in venture capital right around the Silicon Valley, uh, right in the Silicon Valley during the boom and the bust of the first internet bubble, if you all remember that. Uh, learned a lot there. Uh, started my own company. Said, you know, instead of being an investor, I'd, I'd rather be an entrepreneur. And uh, started that. Uh, it was going to be the, the NASCAR of aviation, basically rolling up uh, performances and, and making a series. That blew up on 9-11. It happened, I happened to be in Manhattan the day that the jets hit those towers. Oh, um, wow. You're not gonna start an aviation entertainment company on 9-11, mm. right? Uh, $278,000 in debt, all my own money. I, I said, well, I'll, I'll reinvent myself. We figure that out. And then in 2003, I started what I'm doing now, which is uh, high performance, teams and consulting and, and training. And, and I've uh, spoken over a thousand organizations now. And what I basically have done is unpacked what worked in the Blue Angels, tied in the philosophy around Stanford and, and this, and then more importantly, made it a real world with a thousand leaders like yourself. And I think those, that combination of those three things has led to something that hopefully is meaningful and powerful and others can use. Mm, that's uh very fascinating journey. I, I, I'm curious, how how did you know, how did you have that certainty as a 12-year-old kid when, when you saw those jets fly overhead that that was something you really wanted to do, that the certainty that, you know, the passion was so strong that you were able then when, when you had setbacks to say, okay, how do I overcome this rather than just saying, well, maybe it's not for me? Yeah, great question. Um, I don't think it was an intellectual thing. It was a feeling, right? I mean, I felt it in my heart. And uh, why is that? Well, my dad was military. He was an army officer. So I had, I, I love my dad. You know, he was the epitome of integrity and wisdom. My mom, epitome of love. I had a great childhood. Uh, they allowed me to think expansively. You could become anything you want. You know, hard work, of course, and um, don't give up. And, but the point was, is that I was open. As a, as a child, I think that's a blessed age. I think if you think back to that time frame when you were there or the you know people listening here, uh, you're very impressionable. And uh, I really, when I say a blue angel, I mean, it was no kidding, a blue angel. It wasn't like mm. to be a pilot. It wasn't like be a jet fighter pilot. No, it was like, I'm gonna fly the blue jet. In fact, I wanna be number five. And uh, that's exactly what ha happened. It took me 18 years. Mm. Yeah, that's fascinating. And and when you then left the military and went into Stanford and went into venture capitalism and then started your own business, was it the same passion? Was it the same feeling to start? You with? know, it, it, 
on some of it, not everything, right? So the, the answer to your mm. question, what I'm doing now, absolutely the same passion. I'd rather, I don't need to fly anymore. I just rather share those experiences, that knowledge, that inspiration to help others achieve their dreams. That's what drives me now. Um, and actually in the Blue Angels, uh, it wasn't really about the flying. I mean, the flying is probably the most intense and uh, really on the edge flying you can do. But what I remember the best part about that was going to the crowd line and, and seeing the, the look and the little kids' faces. Uh, and what I realized was that I was really inspiring hopes and dreams. And that to me, was what was powerful. And it wasn't just me, by the way, it's, it's also the mission of the team. Uh, we called ourselves ambassadors of goodwill and uh, that's the role. And I think that that's a critical element for any leader, any entrepreneur out there is that purpose higher than self. You know, we, we all have a drive. You wouldn't be an entrepreneur. Uh, you wouldn't have gotten to where you're, you are, but to get to the next level, I firmly believe you have to not only be in that zone of your skills, but you have to have a purpose higher than self. Yeah, I love that. Um, one of one of the things that struck me as you were explaining that was the concept of inspiring others to be their best and and be a, a model in some ways. Even though, uh, as a, a Blue Angel pilot, you may be inspiring people to do things beyond their wildest dreams, not necessarily being a pilot. So it's kind of like a metaphor for other things. And I think a lot of people in business forget that. Uh, what, why do you think that is that kind of people, once they get into business, become self-absorbed, even though they may have this vision, but they kind of focus so much inward? Well, I think as an entrepreneur, when you're building your own company, there's just a lot to do, right? I mean, <laughs> you can get sucked into the business side of it. And uh, I know for me personally, I love the speaking side. I love what we're doing right now. That comes naturally to me. And I, uh, I work hard at that, but it becomes naturally. All the other business side, that's hard, right? I mean, there's discipline, there's focus, all that stuff. Um, so I guess to answer your question is, it's about connecting to your really true passion. And I like to use the metaphor if I'm in a canoe. The way I the way I tell, you know, because it's hard to say, you know, what are you really passionate about and all that. Hmm. But if I'm if I'm going down river in a canoe and I feel like I'm in the stream and and yes, I, I have to paddle some to avoid the rocks, you know, you're just not riding along, but you feel like you're in the flow, then I know that 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 that's where I should be. When I'm feel like I'm paddling up river, which by the way, right now, switching to all this Zoom and all the uh, virtual things that are going on, it's a lot of hard work, right? I realize I go, mm, okay, that's challenging for me. And it doesn't mean I, I, I can't do it. I will do it, but I'd rather be in the stream, in the flow. Mm, yeah, I love that. Uh, reminds me a little bit, I'm a keen bike rider and uh, <laughs> riding against the wind versus with a tailwind. Uh, but one of the things that it brings up, though, and you, you talked about, you know, the current situation we're in, where we've, um, you know, enforced social distancing because of the coronavirus pandemic, and uh, many people like yourselves who do a lot of in-person speaking and workshops have to adapt and do it online. The having a passion and vision and knowing what your contribution is to your audience is is the thing that keeps you going so for me you know riding into the wind i always think of something that's going to be good out of that and if i'm doing it in the first half of the ride of course the the obvious thing is there's going to be a great tailwind coming back home <laughs> i love it and that's exactly what we've had to do i've you know i've pivoted my whole business i'm sure most people out there have uh if not you need to and uh uh, pivoting your business in times of this, but still keeping the focus of why are you doing it? So I actually see that we're going to come out of this as a world uh, in a much better place. I think people are going to be more compassionate. I think we're going to be more caring. I think we're going to want to help others more. And uh, yes, of course, we'll, we'll still use the tools of which I think business is a beautiful tool to, to help others that uh, we'll, we'll have to adapt. And uh, I actually enjoy that. I love, I love uncertainty. I love change when I'm prepared, okay? I don't like it when I'm not prepared. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, thinking back to your time as a Blue Angel pilot, I'm sure that anything that um, happened 
where you weren't expecting it and weren't prepared for it was potentially really dangerous. Yeah, well, um, one of the keys, and, and I, I like to talk about this in business, is to have um, both the mindset and the operational excellence side. And one of the things that we did on the Blues, and we actually did it in the military, but we did it very differently in the Blues, is what we call briefs and debriefs. So there's preparation before you, you go flying, and most importantly, the learning afterwards. And I'm glad that you and I already chatted that we're going to have a debrief right after this. <laughs> and, uh, and we'll talk about how to make that the most successful debrief ever, by the way, because that is one of the biggest lessons that I teach to, uh, to the world out there. But to answer your question is, yeah, that preparation that focus. And, uh, you know, we would have contingency plans and I'm happy to go into some of the details of what we would do. Uh, we actually had a visualization process where I'm getting my mind and my body and my spirit aligned so that when I'm in that jet, I'm in a state of uh, focused attention. And um, I, that starts well before the flight, by the way. Hmm. Yeah, a lot of preparation would go into that, I imagine. Now, um, how how can people take that process into a business sense? Because yeah. clearly the situation we're in right now was totally unexpected. I mean, I, I don't think anyone a year ago would have known what what was going to happen. And even six months ago when there were signs that, you know, we could have a serious epidemic on our hands, I don't think anybody really could foresee the extent of the impact and so, so how can people in business have contingency plans in place for all kinds of things that you know maybe they can't even imagine right now yeah well um i like to talk about it in the realm of the high performance zone and it's just an analogy that i use all the time which is the gap between where you are and where you're trying to go so uh, i usually start off with okay what do most people do they they measure themselves right so where are we uh, then they set their goals and visions. I like to flip that. I like to say, I think the first thing you need to do is really get clear on where are you trying to go? What is that, that vision? And can you get it down to one sentence? And that's hard. Believe me, it's hmm. hard, right? Um, but that clarity and the process of getting the clarity is what's important, right? Then, of course, you got to measure yourself. And that I check every day. I mean, there's different measurements, you know, business. But as far as where am I as an individual, where am I as a leader, where am I as an organization, right? And there's always a gap, or at least there should be. If there's not a gap, you need to reset your goals. And by the way, one of the key is to reset those before you get there, okay? But the, the key there is then how do you close the gap? And part of that is what you just mentioned contingency planning because there's not one path there's not just one way to close that gap so um not to go too much longer on this but very quickly it's less about the planning and more about being able to adapt quickly to learn from uh, every every event that you do every client that you have and apply those learnings quickly uh, to adjust to certain contingencies that's what i've learned hmm mm. So the debrief is really important. So tell us about the best debrief ever then. Well, uh, actually, you don't remember the best ones. You sure remember the worst ones, okay? <laughs> I mean, that's, that goes through my mind. Uh, the, uh, you know, the, the key about the debrief, very simply, is you don't want to do it just when things go wrong, okay? In business, we typically have, call it whatever you want, win-loss reviews, after-action reviews, um, if there's a problem, what typically happens, you, you start to unpack it and figure out why. Well, that's good. I'm not saying you don't do that. That's absolutely critical. But the, the flip here is you want to do this as part of your standard operating procedures. This wants to become part of your DNA of your organization, right? And what happens at that point is you debrief all the time. And what happens is you're actually unpacking the goods and you're, re, you're, you're reinforcing the positives and you're accelerating those. So uh, on the Blue Angels, we had a very specific process where you would first go around the table and the table was the pilots. And then all my support officers were sitting around me and everybody got a chance to say, number one, generally, how do I feel about the evolution? And then here's the critical thing. Are there any safeties that you made? And a safety was something out of parameters. So the very first thing we did is we pointed the finger at ourselves. We didn't point the finger at anybody else. And it was part of, and it's a culture. Now, if you can get this into your culture as a business leader, 
it is so powerful because you end up getting, you know, accountability. We all want accountability, which you actually get is personal responsibility. And there's these dynamics that we set up in order to do that. And one of them was just what you asked. And that is this inward look first for an outward result. Mm, fascinating. Yeah. So um, the the culture of personal responsibility, I you know, we're seeing a lot in this pandemic in the leadership circles of our politicians all around the world where it, that certainly is not taking place. It's quite the opposite. Everybody else is at fault. Uh, how do you how do you create a safe space where people feel as though they can take personal responsibility for what they've done rather than the approach that we've got to protect ourselves? Yeah, it's beautiful. And, you know, that is actually one of the elephants in the room in most corporations, right, um, is your, the fear, right? And so mm. to answer your question, you did exactly, there's actually five dynamics and you just nailed the first one. And that is you got to create a safe environment. Um, and so now how do you do that is the question you asked. You do it with respect, okay? It's a respect for every individual, uh, every person, doesn't matter what their role is, what their rank is, uh, a deep respect. And it's not just a physical safe environment. Of course you want that. You want a psychologically safe environment. Mm. So the, the way you do that as a leader is you get to set the tone. You get to set the culture. We call it command climate in the military. And um, that's important. So you as a leader get to decide, and you don't have to be the CEO to be a leader. You could be leading you know, a small team, right? You get to decide the, the culture and the environment within your team. And it just gets back to Gandhi. Be the change you want to see in the world. If you want a safe environment, then you need to create a safe environment. You need to show respect. If you want personal responsibility, guess what? You need to be the first one looking inward, calling yourself out. And uh, that's what we did. That's Those are the those are two of the five dynamics. Hmm. And the other th four? <laughs> I was wondering if you were going to ask. Okay. Um, yeah, the, 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 the second one is we said check your ego at the door. Because, yeah. you know, do you expect fighter pilots to have big egos? I don't know, Matt. <laughs> yeah. What do you think? Yeah, I, I guess they would have. All right. Well, well, yeah. What do you think about business leaders, right? And entrepreneurs, yeah, yeah. you know? And we, we say that's not a bad thing. But here's what we said. Check your ego at the door, because when you come into this room, it's about a we, not an I. We're going to have a connection and an extension. We're going to grow. I don't really care who's right or wrong as long as we are growing as an organization and as a team. So the, the first thing was humility. And that's what we look for, by the way, in one of the um, when you recruit and you look at, at who you're going to bring on board the team, you know, um, do they need to be skilled? Absolutely. That's easy, actually. By the time you get to that level of, of anything, you, you can tell who's skilled and who's not. What I want is someone who's humble, okay? Uh, people who are really good at what they do, you will find, typically, they're very humble about that. And, uh, and that, to me, is, is critical for a high-performance team. So that's the second dynamic. Anything you want to say to that before I go to the third? No, I love it. Yeah. All right. Make your ego at the door. Yeah, that's that's something we talk about a lot in our training programs. <laughs> so oh, beautiful. You go that side. <laughs> yeah, beautiful. I like to say if you weren't weren't good, we wouldn't hire you, you know. So let's yeah, get over yeah. that and and let's let's get moving as together. Uh the third one is is you you absolutely want to lay it on the table, is what I call. And that's creating an open environment and an honest environment where let's Put it on the table. And by the table, I, you know, we on the Blue Angels, we actually sat around a conference table, right? And so the idea was you lay it on the table. If there's something that 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 needs to be discussed, we discuss it. Okay. Uh, now obviously there's different levels of how to do that and whatnot. But the point is lay it on the table. You want open and honesty. Uh, the fourth one we already talked about, it's the accountability, but I like to call it an own it and fix it culture. Okay. And it, it's it's this idea of owning the outcome, right? Not just the accountability, but I want the outcome. I want personal responsibility. That's the fourth one. Now, those first four, you know, they're, they're in a lot of organizations, believe me. I mean, we all try to strive for it. I don't think there's anything new there. The fifth one is the critical thing. And that's the glad to be here. Okay. You've yeah. got to have a glad, well, you don't have to. Have, if you have a glad to be here 
mindset wrapped into all of those others, now you get breakthrough performance because now everybody is pulling to that purpose higher than self, that gratefulness. And that's what we need right now. We need it today, but actually you need it every day, no matter what the situation is. Hmm. Yeah, I love the glad to be here mindset. I was um, just making a mental note to myself, um, ask about glad to be here, but you've uh, done a beautiful segue there. So it's a key, it's the kind of the thing that makes the difference in the way to create the culture of personal responsibility. So tell us a little bit more about how you got to this glad to be here and how does that manifest itself in your life and how should it manifest itself in, in all of our lives? Yeah, it's beautiful. Uh, to me, glad to be here is an ethos. It's a mindset. It's a way you choose to see the world and, and the way you live. It's, it's the ability to see a glass as half full and not half empty. Okay. So it, when you live through, when you, when you have a mindset of gratitude and gratefulness, it actually activates the area in our brains where our perceptions come from. And so it allows you to see a situation, take coronavirus, you can see that as an opportunity or a threat. They're both right. I can give you examples for both, right? Mm. So the, the idea is, how do you see the world? But here's what gets really cool, is as you adapt this ethos of glad to be here, it changes the way the world sees you. And that, mm. as a business leader, is breakthrough. That's critical. Yeah, yeah. So how does that work? Yeah, good. So um, the, the idea here is, is you want to you want to instill a pattern in your brain. It's kind of the idea of Hebb's law. I don't know if you heard about this neurons that fire together, wire together. Mm. Right. So it's just the idea of habituation. Right. Now you can have bad habituations. You can have good <laughs> habituations. Right. So why not choose something that's beneficial and powerful? Right. So what I like to do is I like to combine not only the gratitude, but the, the generosity piece, too. And uh, so we give 10 percent of all our fees to charity. Whenever I work with a client, uh, we talk about it first. What are, you, what are you trying to achieve? I don't care if it's a keynote address, if it's a training program, if it's one of our brand new digital programs. Uh, we give 10 percent of that to charity. And I started this Glad to Be Your Foundation. And in the last, I think, nine years, we've been able to donate to over 383 charities around the world. And by the way, we always ask the client, hey, I know you care. I, I'm sure of it, right? Is there a charity near and dear to your heart? And it's amazing how many people, you know, are out there doing good things, right? So this idea of being generous, not just with money, but like today, being generous with your time, being generous with your thoughts, being generous with your wisdom, that actually lights up the area of your brain where self-esteem, where confidence comes from. Hmm. Now, connect the dots. Anybody connect the dots real quick? Yeah. When, you, when you live in what I call the glad to be your mindset, that's a state of gratefulness and generosity, you see things others don't see, and you have the confidence to take the action. That's innovation, by the way. That's creativity. Mm, yeah, and it also, you talked about confidence. It also contributes a lot to that whole safe space and also the learning environment to be able to, okay, I can take a risk on this one because I'm going to debrief at the end and I'll learn from that and I'll apply those learnings to the next time I do something similar or maybe it'll apply to something else I'm doing. Oh, exactly. And, and I don't want people to think that glad beer is just a fluffy feel good thing. It's not. It's mm. two sides to the same coin. It's operational excellence, okay, which we demonstrated you want to have the uh, elite of the elite fly, you know, 36 inches from another jet every day going 400, 500, you know, miles per hour upside down, you better bring your A game, right? So this, yeah. this is operational excellence with this mindset. And when you combine the two, that's what I call fearless success or glad to be you. Hmm. Yeah, love it. Okay, so um, you talked earlier about future state and knowing your future state. How do you, um, how do you then take that vision and kind of map the journey backwards. You know, you talked about starting with the end in mind. So what's your process for kind of mapping the journey backwards and then building in those contingencies along the way? 
How beautiful. I'm so glad you asked the question. So it is a process and it's a framework. I actually call the framework uh, the diamond performance framework, but who cares what they're called? You know, it's about fearless success. So the first diamond, the first facet is this belief levels. Okay. It's not really vision. If you remember back, at least I remember back, strategic management theory will teach you this. And I'm sure everybody in the, the audience already knows this vision, plan, execute, feedback. loop. Okay. We all know that. What's the vision? Come up with a plan execute on the plan, hopefully have a feedback loop, by the way, we can link most people and most organizations. Okay, great. <laughs> so the 1% will do that and they'll do it better than others. And we call it operational excellence. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm saying that's just a starting point. How do you get to the next level? You know, how do you get to the, the, the one tenth of one tenth of 1%? Because that's what the, the blue angels represent. And I said, so I started to reverse engineer this. I started unpacking. I said, well, what worked in that dynamic environment? And how can we build the bridge to business? Because that's the key, right? And uh, so it's not about vision. It's really about beliefs. You know, we as leaders and entrepreneurs, it's about beliefs. You want commitment and buy-in to a vision. So I always start with, okay, where's my limiting and liberating beliefs? And we got them lie out there like crazy right now. It's called fear, okay? Mm -hmm. Fear will stop you more than anything else. That's a limiting belief, okay? But it's it's real, meaning there's you know there's there's people out there who have that. And so how do you overcome that? And uh, there's some techniques and processes that I, I can share with you. But that's just the first facet. Then the answer to your question is you actually move to what I call the brief. And to me, that's about this preparation and this focus. And we were talking a little bit about how can you know entrepreneurs use this. Well, how do you get alignment with your team? So there's some standard things. I do a morning check-in every morning with my team. Of course, we're doing it virtually now. Um, but that's not, it's not about meetings. It's about, okay, do you have this alignment that's going on within the team, right? So the first thing I want to know is I want people to connect, align, and commit. So that's what I'm looking for in this brief process. And of course, you got to have standard operating procedures. You know, everybody know your roles and responsibilities, all basic stuff, right? But that's not what I'm looking for here. And, and what I'm looking for here is this real true human connection, human to human connection. Um, that's where you can then start to accelerate the trust agreements that will allow this high performance execution. So in that briefing process, while I have a standard uh, I always throw in the contingency uh, planning as part of that. And that is, you know, where's like in, in flying with the blues, where's my safety um, obstacles? You know, what happens if the weather changes? So we had contingencies. We had a high show, a low show and a flat show. Very specifically, if the weather's good, then we do our high show. And that's, you know, pure vertical maneuvers. And we need about 8,000 feet, and three miles of visibility to do that. But a lot of times the weather's not there. Just like in business, I can't control anything, everything. Mm. I can control some things, but I have to adapt to the market. I got to adapt to the environment. Well, my market and environment, sometimes I'm over land, sometimes over water. Sometimes the weather's good. Sometimes the weather's bad. I have to be able to adjust. So I don't want to wing it airborne. So what we did is we actually trained and practiced to different levels of contingency. And the first one we said, well, if the weather's down to 3,503, we'll call it a low show. We'll practice that. We'll change those vertical maneuvers, turn them into rolling oblique maneuvers, and boom, we can do a show. And, and to the customer, they don't even know the difference. Same thing with the client. Maybe they, they don't want to buy everything. Maybe they're, the solution you're providing is, 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 is not what they need. So you got to ha have some, uh, some adjustments. And then you always need to know your no-go. And that's what we had. It was a thousand feet and three. If the weather was below those minimums, we're not flying. I mean, and uh, so you have to be able to say, when are you going to say no? Hmm. Yeah, I love that. Um, and I think in business, particularly for small business and entrepreneurs, the when when to say no bit is quite a challenge. And I think the analogy or the metaphor of um, the blue angels and flying is, is a really powerful one because clearly there had to be a point where you say no. Yeah. And I got to tell you, it's just like in business, the, um, the black and white's not hard. Okay. If it's really bad weather, it's really bad yeah. weather. You're not going flying. Right. Yeah. Um, it's right. It's always the gray area. You know, mm. it's like, Oh man, it's a thousand and two and three quarters. And yeah, can you, can we make this work? And, and, you know, that's a judgment call. And I think that um, you also, what I've learned in, in life and business is it's not black and white. 
you really can't say a thousand and three is the absolute. That's going to be how do I say this? You got to have a, a standard, but you have to make judgments based on those standards. Now, mm. be aware uh, if you make a judgment as a leader and things don't work out. Guess what? You're accountable to that. Now, as long as you can justify yourself um, to your you know, superiors or whatever, then great. You know, um, and that happened to us in in England. I know we have a lot of people in uh, in Great Britain, right? You were telling me. Yeah. When I did my, I took the team in the early '90s. I was the uh, lead solo pilot and the operations officer in 1992. And if you remember, a lot had changed in the world back then. Berlin Wall had come down. Uh, the world was changing, you know, in 89. The Berlin, and, and the world was changing like crazy. So uh, I said, hey, boss, let's take the team to Europe. But let's not go to NATO. We've been there. And we did some NATO shows. Let's go to Moscow. Let's fly you with the Russians, okay? Let's go to Bulgaria. Let's go to Romania. And we did. It took me three years to get it through the State Department, Department of Defense, the White House. In 1992, I took the team to Moscow. And we flew uh, with the Russians, against the Russians, and we had so many lessons I can share with you there. Uh, but on the way back, we were coming through um, London, and uh, I can't remember the exact airfield, but it's a British training airfield just north of London. And it was one of those days where we're only there one day. The weather was right at 1,003 or actually a little bit below. And uh, we're standing out there, and we're, we're like going, wow, you know, what are we going to do? And I remember the boss looking at me. And uh, we waited for about 45 minutes on the tarmac. So there's, you know, 100,000 people there. And this is it. You get one chance to see the blues and that's it. Finally, the boss looked at me and goes, Gucci, that's my call sign. We can talk about that later. You know, all fighter pilots, we get call signs. By the way, if you like it, it doesn't stick. So, you know, but anyhow, um, he said, Gucci, can the solos do it? Because the real issue was the visibility that day. And uh, so I'm like second in command, CEO. And I say, um, yes, sir, boss, we can do it. And he goes, okay. We're going to go flying. Boom. So he made that command decision. And uh, it was, uh, you know, it was, it was a gray area. Now, when we landed the jets and everything went fine, I mean, it was okay. It was a tough show, but we, we, we were fine. When we landed the jets and we had our debrief, the very first thing the boss said, and by the way, I, I have this on video and I, I, I share this with leaders around the world about how to, con how to do a, a really constructive debrief. Uh, what he said was, he says, I'm glad we went flying today. And then he says, you know, I was a, I was 50 feet low on a maneuver. He basically was saying it's a safety, and, and he was just acknowledging something that no one else could see. Uh, but then number two, Fudge looks at the boss and goes, boss, I'm glad we went flying today also. And here's my, here was where I was off on the loop break cross or something like that. And we went around the table. And what was really happening was this. Very quickly, this is how you can get clear, concise communication. Very quickly, the boss was saying, Look, I knew that was a, 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 a great decision. I'm happy I made the decision I did. And Fudge, number two, looks at him and goes, boss, you can make that decision anytime. I'm with you 100%. As a leader, wouldn't you like to know that? Wouldn't mm. you like to know how your people really feel about your decision making? And that's what this Glad to Be Your Debrief will get you. Mm. Yeah, that's uh, very... Very powerful and uh, fascinating story too, and and you're right. You know, there's there's so many gray areas, and uh, in one of the things that when I was doing my research, I came up with as a, as a question, and I'm curious to hear your take on this. In in your life in the Blue Angels, obviously there, it was sort of life and death consequences on some of these decisions. So when you're in those gray areas, you know the the consequences of making a mistake can be disastrous. Now, in business, why do people have a slightly different mindset about the consequences of making some of those decisions? I mean, obviously, some of the big decisions can result in, you know, business uh, business going bankrupt or whatever. But some of the smaller decisions that day to day, why do people have a different mindset about those? Yeah, you know, I, I, I got asked that exact question um, at Stanford Business School uh, a couple of years ago. It's, they, they invite me back and I get a chance to talk to everybody. And, and someone brought up the question and was said, well, yeah, but in the Blue Angels, it's, it's different, right? It's life or death. I'm not life or death and, and this kind of stuff. And, uh, and here's my answer then, and, and it's, it's still the same, is the fundamentals 
are the same, whether it's life or death or whether it's a business decision, it's the same principles and the same fundamentals, okay? The question is, are you gonna hold yourself accountable to those same principles and fundamentals? And all life or death does is it just makes it real, right? I mean, it just makes you wake up a little bit and you go, you know what? Uh, when I say I'm gonna do something, if I say I'm gonna clear a maneuver, if I say I'm gonna be at 36 inches, guess what? I'm gonna be there. You know, you can count on me to be there. Now, if I'm off, we we do have ways to you know to handle those kinds of things. But it just it just is so it's so interesting to me. It's it's the same, you know. And once you realize that, and you operate your own self in that same mode, then you start to realize that um, it all it all works, right? And in fact, I think you can learn more from those challenging decisions or those life and death decisions on how to apply it in your everyday life and watch what happens to your business. It'll skyrocket. Hmm. Yeah. Well, on that note, John, I could keep talking for ages about uh, high performance and your lessons and delve into some of the stories that I know you've shared on other podcasts. So what we might do is, is place links in the show notes to some of your other podcasts so people can listen to some of the stories that you haven't told us here today. I think it's a good point now, just looking at the time to move on to the buzz, which is our innovation round. And it's designed to help our audience who are primarily innovators and leaders in their field with tips from your experience. So I've got five questions and hopefully you'll give us some really insightful answers that will inspire our listener to go and do something awesome as a result today. So you ready? Ready. <laughs> ready to take a mark. That's what we say in the Blue Angels. When you say ready to take a mark, it means yeah. I'll point my nose at you at a thousand miles per hour closer. We'll miss within a wingspan and you can count on me to be on point. <laughs> Great. All right. Well, what's the number one thing you think anyone needs to do to be more innovative? Well, I think it's back to the glad to be here, right? I think if you really want to truly be innovative, you need to really start to live in, in that glass half full, not half empty mindset. And that comes from gratitude. It comes from gratefulness. Uh, it comes from generosity. You know, I, every morning I wake up, I do my glad to be here, wake up, happy to share this with everybody. And that is the minute I wake up is I just say, what am I grateful for? Especially today, you know, and, and it could be that I'm healthy, I'm strong. I'm happen to be home with my wife. Usually I'm on the road 300 days out of the year, right? And so the idea here is, this building a habit of, of gratefulness, that'll expand your mind. And then you watch the ideas are unbelievable. The innovation will come to you. Uh, and the other technique is not only grateful for the present moment, I just go back 24 hours, say what happened yesterday that I have something to be grateful for. Start thinking about others, their faces, and, uh, and then go forward in your day and think about others, not just yourself. Watch what happens. Watch the ideas that come to your mind. Very powerful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And as you mentioned earlier, it, it kind of changes the way your brain works and your neuron fires and the things that you start to notice. So yeah, wonderful. What's the best thing you've done to develop new ideas? Well, it's living in the present moment, right? And mm -hmm. so what I mean by that is I, I am a, you know, I'm a thinker. I'm, I'm one of the, you know, I'm an entrepreneur, right? So I'm always looking ahead, right? I'm always saying, what if, what if this? And what I realized is that there's so much power in being focused and, and that starts with the present moment, right? So uh, I've learned, and, and I, I learned this on the Blue Angels, to be able to take my brain, focus down when I need to and open up when I need to. And uh, we actually do that. The human brain can do that 65 times a second when I snap my fingers. You get 65 chances to open up or focus down. And uh, I'll give you an example, when I was coming at my opposer thumper in, in an opposing maneuver at that thousand miles per hour closer, I'm in such a state of focus, I can see when his nose would can't a little bit, but I can't stay that focused for too long, really about 45 seconds. Then you need to open up your brain and see situational awareness, what else is going mm -hmm. on? And so it's really true in business and life. And that is we need to go through this open up focus down, open up and focus down. And when you learn to do that, you get into a flow and you'll see things that are out there that, um, that you wouldn't normally see if, you, if you're too myo myopic on the focus. Mm, yeah, I love that. And, and it's such a wonderful experience to be able to do that. We, we do an exercise in one of our workshops where, you know, if you do it really well, you can actually 
see what's happening almost over your shoulder. Um, and, and I imagine you've got that skill nailed because of um, your experience in, in flying those planes. Situational awareness. It's amazing yeah. how you could expand that, right? It's mm. great. And, and, and focus when it's appropriate, as you say. Yes. All right. Now, do you have a favorite resource you use most often? Yeah. Well, the, the resources that I go to is actually spiritual texts. Okay. That's where mm -hmm. I spend a majority of my time. And by spiritual, it doesn't have to be religious. It's wisdom. I'm looking for wisdom. Right. And so uh, I will constantly seek out wisdom and not just books. I mean, I will go to other people's events. You know, I speak, like I said, a hundred times a year, at least I used to. Right. Um, yeah. And, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll stay there the whole day as much as I can and listen to other speakers. I'll help them, you know, I'll, I'll we'll debrief. But so for me, the tool is getting out there and learning from others and, and being very specific that I'm looking for wisdom. That's what I want to, that's what I want to find. Hmm. Yeah, I love that. I think there's um, there's been a lot of conversation recently around um, the wisdom frame, I call it, and it's around you know we've we've got this ability now, and particularly now when we're in isolation, of using the internet to put information out there, um, but a lot of that information is just noise, and and to have have it presented as a way that is wisdom. That's that's a really you know, sharing somebody's experience like you're doing today in a way that actually helps people change their lives, change their business. That, that I think is a really important kind of positioning. Well, how do you, how do you define wisdom? Yeah, good question. <laughs> so you've got me on the spot now. I have to articulate something for me. It's, um, I guess it's something concrete that I can then take on board and apply in my personal life rather than just, oh, that's nice. That's nice to know, or it's nice to know. So it's something that perhaps inspires me. Perhaps um, I find applications that are in different areas. That that to me is wisdom. Or, or something like I had this experience recently where I participated in a, a webinar and I thought, that actually fills a gap I've had in one of my training programs where I thought there's, there was always the feeling that there was a disconnect between a couple of the modules or there was a hole there. And I went through that program and I thought that fills that hole. That's a perfect match. That's so that to me is wisdom. Love it. Yeah. You just taught me something. Thank you. Okay, great. Now what's the best way to keep a, a project on track. I think we've talked a little bit about this, but maybe you could give us a bit of a summary again. <laughs> yeah, I think you're right. It's, it's really simply that the debrief is the most important part. Mm -hmm. And I think you don't do, you don't do that just when you're doing your project timelines and all that kind of stuff, right? It has to become uh, part of your cadence, uh, part of your DNA. Uh, and to me, that debrief needs to encapsulate the glad to be here. So it's just glad to be here debrief. That is the number one thing that you can do to accelerate all your performance, but it's not in a, you know, it's not in a vacuum. I mean, you, you, you still got to have those beliefs, the preparation, you got to have high trust contracts where you're executing alignment, but the debrief is the most critical element. Mm, yeah. Love it. All right. Well, what's the number one thing anyone can do to differentiate themselves? Just be yourself, be authentic. Come on, man. I mean, uh, uh, I, I think, I think if you are trying to be someone you're not, people will sense that and they smell it and, and, you know, no, just be yourself. Uh, and, and I think that vulnerability is the, is the trait you want, you know, there's actually strength in vulnerability. Mm. Yeah. Well, you talked about, um, humility earlier on and about having the ability to set aside your ego, having the confidence to set aside your ego and say, I own that. I know I, I didn't do what I set out to do here or, or I need to improve here. I think that's a, a real valuable thing. And I think there's, you know, embracing vulnerability helps you do that. Okay. Great. Well, thanks for getting us through the buzz round, John. This has been fascinating. And now where can people find out more about you, learn about your book, your work, and maybe even reach out and say thank you for what you've shared today. 
Oh, that'd be great. You know, we uh, oh, we have a website. It's called John Foley Inc. John Foley Inc. dot com. That's more for the business leaders and and whatnot. Uh, a different website called Glad to Be Here dot com, and uh, that has a you can sign in if you want, sign up uh, and be part of this movement. We're trying to inspire a billion people around the world. So uh, sign up, become part of the list, uh, or just follow us on social. You know, we're we're on everything there, and so I'm glad to be here in John Foley and. Uh, I'm out there making a lot of videos now, you know, in times like this, uh, I've been doing special stuff for healthcare providers, first responders, and we're really um, trying to, trying to just give this, this is a time of giving. Hmm. Yeah. And I think, you know, I've seen some really wonderful examples where people have taken that approach of giving right now. Um, there was one I saw the other day on the news. It was a coffee shop, um, can't remember which country it was in, but um, it was an Australian who had moved, maybe it was China, um, to a coffee shop and they were giving away coffees to first responders, to healthcare professionals all around. They were delivering them to the hospitals. And I said, you know what? Which cafe are people going to be going to? Uh -huh. All of those people that were touched, which cafe are they going to go and get their coffee from when this is all over? And, you know, I mean, apart from giving and and it being the right thing to do, it's actually really smart business. Well, and I think, you know, with everyone who's on this call, we all have something to give. And I think it's back to one of our questions is the wisdom, you know, your knowledge, your understanding, your wisdom um, and, and, and sharing that to people right now. Uh, I just recently uh, made a video uh, shared with over 120,000 healthcare providers. And, uh, you know, it was personal to them, but it's really about everything, right? And so this 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 giving mindset is really part of the, the glad to be here. And then rejoice. You know, the other thing, you got to enjoy life. I mean, let's rejoice and have fun. This has been an amazing conversation. And, and that book, if you want, you can check out Fearless Success. It's on Amazon. It's all over the place, whatever you want. Mm. But uh, the last chapter will give you the most insight into my next book, which I'm calling The Seven Perfections. And uh, that'll be interesting. Just wait. Oh, wow. That. <laughs> Great. Well, when can we look forward to that one? Uh, still writing it. Who knows? Yeah. We'll see. <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, is there a parting bit of advice you'd like to leave our listener today, John? I, I just leave with rejoice, you know, um, uh, be grateful. Uh, this has been a tremendous um, experience to be with you. Uh, I, I will say that, um, I have a friend who, uh, Michael Roach, a great guy, he wrote a book called The Diamond Cutter, and he has four steps, and I'll share with you those, very similar to what I described earlier. First is, uh, what do you want? You know, define what you want in one sentence. Second, um, find someone else who wants something similar. So all of us here as entrepreneurs, you know, we're all trying to help each other, right? So, so find someone who's trying to do something similar. Third step is actually go help them, you know, show up like you do on podcasts and, and, and do something to help people. Right. But the fourth one is the one that most people forget. And it's actually the most important. And that is rejoice in what you've done. And when I go to bed, I will be thinking about this podcast. I, I will be grateful that we had a chance to spend this time and uh, I'll rejoice over all the listeners out there and, uh, making a difference with other people. Pass it mm -hmm. on make that yeah. difference and live the glad to be here mindset. That's it. Yeah, that's wonderful. I love that because I think particularly with the feedback that we've been talking about and uh, debriefs, uh, people tend to, and, and goal setting, people tend to get to their goal or get to the debrief and say, okay, tick, that's done and, and forget to rejoice and forget to celebrate that they've actually achieved something here. And, and whilst we've moved the goal and, we're on to the next uh, goal. It is important to celebrate and rejoice. Thanks, John. Um, finally, who would you like me to chat with on a, a future and over Buzz podcast and why? Oh, absolutely. Josh Linkner. Do you know Josh, by the way? No, I don't. Uh, you want to get to know him. He's an expert on innovation. He and I speak a lot uh, together at different conferences and 100% uh, uh, reach out to Josh. Jordan's his CEO. He'll, he'll help set it up for you. Okay, we'll we'll reach out to Josh. Maybe we'll get an introduction from you and get him on a yeah. future and overbuzz conversation. And uh, look forward to that as well. So thanks I'm so speaking much. Speaking to Jordan tomorrow, I'll let him know. Absolutely. Great. Thank you.
Well, thanks so much for sharing your time and your insights with us today and your wisdom. Uh, I've really enjoyed this immensely. I've learned a lot more about uh, you know, how you've applied your experience in the Blue Angels in particular, how you've taken that and built a business system there, the whole glad to be here philosophy. I love that. So all the best for the future and, and let's stay in touch. Thank you, Jürgen. I, I really enjoyed this. Uh, I'll remember your face tonight and, and tomorrow <laughs> morning. And thanks for all your listeners. Uh, glad to be here. Yep, glad to be here. Thanks, John. I hope you enjoyed that engaging and inspiring conversation with John and took something away from his episode. John shared so much valuable advice and so many tips to build and maintain high-performing teams, it's really hard to pinpoint my favourite. I did love going through his best debrief ever, which we actually did in real for this episode after I ended the recording. It's certainly a very powerful feedback process that leads to new information and new learnings. I'd love to know what you took away from John's episode. Leave a comment below the blog post, which you can find at innovabiz.co forward slash John Foley. That is J-O-H-N-F-O-L-E-Y. All lowercase, all one word, innovabiz.co forward slash John Foley. You'll also find contact information for getting in touch with John there, as well as links to his website, his social media pages, his keynote speeches, his Fearless Success book, and the other resources we spoke about in today's conversation. John suggested that we have a conversation with innovation expert and author of Disciplined Dreaming and The Road to Reinvention, Josh Linkner, on a future InnovaBuzz podcast episode. So Josh, keep an eye on your inbox for an invitation from us to the InnovaBuzz podcast, courtesy of John Foley. Tune in again to the next episodes of the Innova Buzz podcast where we have even more fantastic guests lined up, including on-demand CFO Mr. Biz Ken Wentworth and empathy expert Dr. Mark Goulston. Thanks for listening to this episode. Make sure you subscribe to the show to be reminded of new episodes. It's free to subscribe. Leave a review if you like. Even if you don't like me, I'm okay with that. I'm asking you to leave a review because it helps other people find this show. Go to innovabiz.co to join our marketing transformation community and access a free gift my team and I made for you. It's the Marketing Master Mini Class. We want to give you everything you need to transform your marketing into a human-centered, relationship-focused growth engine. Until next time, I'm Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz. Remember, be awesome and keep innovating.